Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Vanessa Dunn Guyton, and I am the proud founder and executive director of Hush No More. Hush No More supports survivors when they're ready to come forward to share their story, to get resources, or just to have somebody to listen to. We also provide training in our communities on what we call the Hush Topic, sexual assault, domestic violence, sex trafficking, child sexual abuse, incest, all of those topics that families, organizations have a hard time discussing, but we need to. So today we have an episode of Hush No More Champions, which is a different day because normally it's on Tuesday at 8 p.m., but we needed to come forward and have a special conversation tonight about male survivors and those who advocate on the behalf of other males. And so that's what the topic is gonna to be about today. It's gonna to be an interesting show because we want to bring awareness to male survivors. And so that is our goal today. We look at survivors and advocates and nonprofit organizations to be able to share what they're doing in the community. So tonight we have Mike Cochran. So let me bring him in. Hello, Mike. Hey. How are you? <laughs> I'm all right. Thanks for having me all on. Right. So I am excited because today we're doing something different. We normally don't do Wednesday nights, but we're going to talk tonight about being a male survivor and advocating and different things that you're doing in the community to raise awareness. So can you tell the audience a little bit about Mike? Who is Mike today? Well, I'm, I'm 59. I'm going to be about six. I'm going to be not about 60. I'm going to be 60 here in about six weeks. And uh, I'm retiring out of the Army on my 20, on my 60th birthday on the 28th of June. And that's, that's my last day in uniform. And uh, I have uh, had several careers over the course of my, my 60 sh uh, short years on the planet. But uh, my most recent is that of being back in the military. And I had a I had a 22 year break in service, and I believe I have the state record for, for that that type of break. I was 23 when I got off of active duty in 1985, and I reenlisted in 2006 when I was 45. So there's two different armies. I can I can tell you the world had changed a lot in those those 22 years, yeah. and uh, so uh, I uh, but I grew up uh, right here in West Virginia and in a really, really poor part of Appalachia and uh, uh, managed to make my way and enlisted into the Army. And then uh, after I got off of active duty, I was a state trooper for, for five years. And I was in a pretty horrific shooting and, uh, and a partner was killed. And uh, because of my childhood, uh, and I, that's where I lay it, I, I didn't know how to deal with that. So I moved on to a, a couple of different things. and. Uh, at the same time, when that happened, I met, I met my wife, and had it not been for her, I don't think I'd be here today. And uh, so uh, we uh, we opened up a child care center, and we went from I think you know, when we first started, we had twenty couple kids, and at the peak, we had between three hundred and three hundred and fifty. Uh, and in the meantime, I, I did a lot of construction work because I found out I could I could build a daycare center, and. Uh, so I did that, and when that became a little, started to wear on the body, I, I picked up a degree along the way from West Virginia University, and I, I started teaching school. And I took uh, at, a, at an alcohol and drug rehab center for teenagers, and I took a two of my two, two of my students to get their armed services test, and I was asked if I was there for mine as well, and that's how I ended up back in the military. It was a it was a fluke, but when I found out I could reenlist at 45, I didn't think about it. I, I knew in my gut I had to do it. And uh, had I not done that, I wouldn't be here today. I, this that has been the vehicle that has propelled me into doing what I believe is is my purpose on the planet. And there has been absolutely nothing bad come out of it. And uh, out of all the things I've done, I'm, I'm just, I'm so thankful that, that I was able to do this. And, uh, this is my vehicle to do what I, I plan to do, you know, for the rest of my time. Mm -hmm. How long have you been a victim advocate? I, you know, with age, you tend to forget years, but I believe I started in 2009. It was okay. either 2009 or 2010, but I'm pretty sure it was 2009. Yeah, so that you know, about twelve years. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, when I was on active duty the first time, we didn't have victim advocates. We didn't we didn't do this. And when when I found out that we had them because of my my history, I knew I had to do it. And uh, so I volunteered to do it. And you know that's been you know ever since it's been been very rewarding. Thank you for being a victim advocate. We need more people to come forward and say, I want to help survivors. Like I want to be in this fight. And so I applaud you. Mm -hmm. For, for being that male, you know, that, that sounding board, that means a lot. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to know, how was your life growing up? What did the little Mike look like? As a young boy, is that what you're getting at? As a, as a young boy, what did Mike look like? What was his life like? Uh, well, well, as compared to now, you know, young, skinny, gangling, uh, you know, outgrew my feet. Uh, I had a, my, I had a mop of hair that, that you know, I had an afro. Can you look at this? Can you see that? I had an afro that was, oh my God. Um, I never, never, nobody could it just, it was, I don't know where it came from, but uh, we, uh, I grew up in, in, in Webster County, West Virginia. And it, uh, we we lived in a three room house, you know, with with an outside toilet, and uh, uh, that was, you know, it was it was rough. But uh, you know, usually during the summer, I didn't wear shoes because I didn't have them, and uh, I wore you know, any hand me down that I could get a hold of. And I'm not complaining about this. This is this was just the way it was. It doesn't bother me that that's how that's how I lived. That's just the way it was, and um, so. But I did well in school. I was, uh, I mean, I did I did really well in school, and um, so in my but in my in my freshman year in high school, my parents decided we were going to move, and we moved from Webster County. And although that ultimately turned out to be the best thing that ever happened, uh, I you know no no fourteen year old wants to leave his buddies, and uh, I quit trying at that point. And that's when, you know, I was, I made the honor roll the first half of the freshman year and the second half, I barely passed. And it was during my 13th year when I was in eighth grade, that's when I was molested. So, you know, through high school, I just, I just eked out an existence. I, you know, I was, I was going to quit school uh, at 16. And uh, so, but when we moved from that, that little house, we, we moved to, to another county and I thought we'd moved up. We moved into a four room house with an outside toilet. But there was a, a young teacher who moved into a basement apartment across the road. And that, that, that young man single handedly rescued me. And took, I mean, he, he did. He took care of me, took me under his wing, kept me interested in school. And, uh, had it not been for him, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am now. And, uh, uh that was, that's, you know, that was, uh, the sole defining moment in my life was when I met that man. And, uh, so that was, but, you know, to be a young boy, I was, I spent a lot of time hungry. Um, there, my, my mother had, something called an AV malformation on her brain. And you, in layman's terms, it was a tangled up mass of blood veins intertwined throughout the structure of her brain and caused her to have be to have really bad headaches. And along with that, she had a borderline personality disorder. And my dad it was a World War II Navy veteran and he was not an armchair commando. He would he had been sunk a couple of times and I uh, was shell shocked. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be 20 years old floating in shark infested waters in the South Pacific. And he, uh, he drank and he, he, he drank a lot and, and my mom got into the drugs. So those, that childhood was, you know, it, it produced a, a man who, you know, had that sense of what the world was like. That was my sense of normal. And, um, so that, but that's just how it was. But the right people showed up at the right time to it seemed like to, to steer me in the right direction. And and Randy King, that was the teacher. And uh, we ended up being almost best friends. I mean, he was one of the few people on the planet that I could trust. 
and he, he, he steered me in the right direction. And, uh, but those kinds of people always seem to show up and these folks always seem to have a work ethic, good moral character. And I just found that I, I wanted to try to be as much like them as I possibly could. So, uh, everything that I wasn't getting from within the, the construct of the nuclear family, I got from without that construct. And, you know, it was a, it was bumpy, even though, but you know, I, it, it came out okay. I wouldn't trade what has happened to me to, to be where I am today for anything. I had the right parents to be who I am. Right. And so, you know, I can't, I just, I'm happy. I'm just. And a great. Go ahead. So as a child, you mentioned your molestation. Is that something that you want to talk about yeah. today? Or is it something that you would like to share with other men? I always wonder if, men can relate to other men as it comes to child sexual abuse or any type of sexual assault for men. And I think it's important to be able to hear, yeah, I went through some stuff. Uh, anecdotally, I don't have any data, but I, I know that from my own experience, when I do a training or something like that, I, I, find, I find that guys really haven't, it's much easier for them to talk to somebody like me. Mm -hmm. um, so, especially when I, you know, when I talk about the type of molestation that I had gone through. Um, so it's like, you know, they will find out you know, if somebody like me can stand up in front of people and talk and, and not get too rattled about it. And then, then all of a sudden it gives them the courage or instills in them the courage. They already had it. They just didn't know it. Uh, they're just, you know, finally not, a, not afraid to use it. And uh, so that's it's very it's very rewarding, but you know to to talk about what I what happened to me I I'm you know I'm always willing and open. Um, I'd never say it's easy, but you know after 20 years it's it's it, it's easier to do I guess I should say it's not an easy thing to do but it's easier. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was uh, you know, I was molested by my mom at 13 years old. And that's, of course, I was I was going through puberty and I was a fairly big 13 year old. Uh, at the time I was 14, I was hairier than my dad. And uh, but, you know, looking back, I can I can see things you know, I, at the time. I didn't know that that's what was going on. But, you know, I could see the, the things that she had done were grooming. And, you know, for instance, you know, bathing, uh, she would. Uh, tell me that I was I was getting hair on my face and I, she'd help me shave and uh, but the the baths the, the, those were the worst because you know, I couldn't help the arousal and I always felt ashamed and I felt guilty and I felt dirty uh, after that I never you know that was just because I could not help becoming aroused when that when she would wash me I just I couldn't make that not be and uh, as a result of that I didn't play football. And I was very, very good at playing football, but because at such a young age, I'd been exposed to that kind of arousal. I could not be around anybody else if like in the shower room or something like that. I couldn't do it without being aroused. And, and, and then uh, so I, I didn't play football. And that's that's one thing I really wanted to do. So. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, I had rheumatic fever and it made my knees hurt. So I got an excuse from having to do gym or anything like that because we were required to shower and I couldn't do that. I just I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so secondary effects of that from, from not showering and not having a place to bathe at home, I got scabies. And uh, that was bad. I mean, that was I mean, that was <laughs> that was bad. And. I never knew what it was. I just knew I, had, I just itched all the time, and um, which tailed on to earlier in, in my life when I when I was a really young man or young, young boy, uh, five, maybe six years old. We lived in a house that, that was owned by an uncle, and it was it was a it was this tiny little shack. We had dogs that lived under it, and those dogs fleas seemed to stay in my bed. And I just had to lay in that bed and just scratch and my legs would just bleed. And dad would pull ticks out of my head. And I just, I mean, tick after tick after tick. It really hurt. 
And so mom would, would clean me up. And, you know, I never, she never knew, dad never knew, knew that that happened. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tell him. And she, but mom always told me dad didn't want me. And so when dad just had a little too much to drink and he boots across the floor, well, that confirms that in a young boy's mind. And uh, so that's just, that's just how that worked out. You know, then, you know, when there came, came the time that, you know, I, I was, I was 13 years old and she, you know, was going to teach me how to be a man. And I thought, okay, I'm ugly. I'm dirty. Nobody's going to ever want me. And uh, that's, that's when it happened. And I, you know, that was my normal. And it was, uh, it was, you know, you carry that, you know, forever. And, so that that's what happened. I was 13 years old, and um, I was, you know, to say I was never the same was, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't tell anybody till I was 39. What's that? It's an understatement to say that you'll never be the same. Like you won't. Yeah. From that moment on, that changed you who you were. It most definitely did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it did. I, I never told anyone till I was 39, and. I, I, I never had much of an opinion on, on repressed memories. I, I've always been a really open-minded skeptic, you know, okay, if there's a ghost, show me one. I don't disbelieve it, but you know, that's just how I feel. But I had, I'd been with a, with a psychiatrist for close to two years and was really feeling quite well. And um, I had a, a, a dream one night before a particular meeting the next day and it just happened to be with her with with my counselor and uh, uh she the counselor was wanting me to go into this room that that didn't have it was a room without form or shape or walls or anything like that it was a void more more like anything else and it wasn't that it was dark it was an absence of light and that that nuance was what terrified me about going into that room and I told my wife about that dream that morning and she, she said, well, you have a, have an appointment this morning. It's probably pretty important. You might want to talk about that. And I was, I was in the middle of recounting that dream when I just froze and the doctor asked me what was wrong. I said, and I just looked at her and said, I remember. And, and that's, that's when it hit me. Uh, and I started to cry and it's, it's, it's difficult to say, talk about this and it's mm-hmm. to say it, but that's, I just sat there and she waited on me and she said, you know, tell me when you're ready. And I said, I remember what happened. And then that's when the shame and the guilt and everything flooded over me. And she said, what happened? And I said, mom, mom made me have sex with her. I just, I just racked. I mean, I, I was, I said, I almost peed my pants and I cried. I couldn't stop crying. I just, I cried till I was dry and could, nothing else would come out. And she, she asked me something and she, and I said, I don't want for this to have happened. And the, the enormous, the enormity of knowing that it had, and I could never undo it. I, once it was out, once I acknowledged it, it couldn't, I couldn't, I was, I was forever. I, I committed the ultimate taboo and I, that was, I couldn't live with that. And I, I wouldn't leave her office. And the, the lady was, she was so kind to me. She canceled her next appointment. She, she said it was an emergency and, and she canceled the next point. I said, I can't leave. I cannot go. I don't want, I don't want anybody to see me. And I sat there for another hour and we talked and I, I don't, I don't remember that. I don't remember what we said, yeah. but um, I, when I left, I said, you got to take me out the back door. Again, I don't want people to look at me. And I was, and I wouldn't look at her because and she asked me why. And I said, cause I think you can see it. I think you can. And she said, why? And I said, it's, it's shame. I said, I don't want, I don't want you to see it. That's all I can say. Mike, 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 Mike. And uh, sorry about that. Um, so, so when I, I got, I got home and I, and I told my, I told my wife, I'd tell her all over again. And she, she was awesome, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at her. And she asked me the same thing. She said, why won't, why won't you look at me? And I said, because I think you can see it. 
I think you could see what I did. And she said, you didn't do anything. And then I, I started crying all over again. And uh, so that, that day, I went to my aunt's back up in Webster County. We got in the car and we drove. I said I wanted to see her because she had taken care of me a lot when I was a little boy. And um, and she was she was she was really good to me. I mean, she didn't, you know, she didn't. She she said it wasn't your fault, and she just was. She said, "I just wish I knew." And I said, "You know, who's gonna believe? Who was gonna? I didn't think I had anybody to tell." Yeah. And and the reason was I had, uh, you know, I, I told you that mom had the that malformation on her brain. Well, dad had also fallen off a garage and, and broke his back. And there were times they were both in the hospital. I thought they were both going to die. I and mean, we're talking from the time I was 12, 13, 14 years old. I, I thought they were going to die. And dad was really messed up. And, and and mom had this thing on her head. So I spent I spent a lot of time alone. And I'd, I'd go home at night, even though I had the opportunity to stay with my aunt. There were some nights I was so, I was so hurt that I would, I was too ashamed to cry. So I would go home and I'd stay alone and I'd curl up in the bed and I just, I just lay there and ball. I just cry all night long. And that's when there were times the only place I ate was at school because I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't stand being around anybody seeing me that upset. I thought I was weak and, and a baby. Um, uh, it, at one time, it, it overcame me at school, and I got a I, my, I got a stomach ache that had me doubled over. And this was the one moment in school that I felt like defined my worth. Uh, I went to the school principal. And I mean, I, I was doubled over, and, and I said, "My mom and dad are both in the hospital, and my aunt is the only place I have to go." And he called her, and I could hear her on the phone, and he said. Carolyn, that was that's her name. He said, you have a sick boy here. Well, she thought it was her son. And he said, no, it's Mike. Well, I couldn't hear anything after that. And he said, OK, I'll bring him to you in a little bit. And when he did, when he hung up the phone, he looked at me and he said, when she found out it was you, she didn't care. And it was at that moment I, I was. I was alone. I just I, I, I didn't have anybody. And I, I can't tell you what that felt like. And you know, then, of course, you know, the, I'm pretty sure I was 12 years old when that happened. That was the next year that, you know, that she molested me. And uh, and then we moved. So that that, you know, that three year period was it was too much. It was it was just too much for a young boy. And but I remembered all that. I remembered her dumping hot cream of wheat on me because she got mad at me and stuck to my skin. And I didn't, I didn't have a shirt on and I can't remember why she got mad at me. There was one of those things. She just, you know, she got mad at me, poured it on me. And it's just, that's just, you know, she beat me with sticks. Um, it was just, you know, that's, I mean, at the same time she's growing me. She's, you know, telling me dad doesn't want me and, you know, oh, and the, the enemas, that was her tool. She had an enema bag. Uh, and if I got the, you know, cause I had a lot of stuff, my stomach was upset a lot and she would, she pull out that enema bag and fill that thing up with whatever it was she did. And she, I mean, and she was pretty rough. She'd manhandle me and she shoved that thing up in me and just squeeze it. And I could feel that stuff go up in there. And then she wouldn't let me go. She said I had to hold it. And sometimes I could break loose. So I'd run. I mean, I just run to, and, and that stuff would come running out of me on the floor. And I have to clean it up. And that's just, um, you know, that was, that was all. That was just how mixed up it was. And I brought that into adulthood. You know, and uh, tried to, you know, just survive. That's really all. Really all I could do. I know that was a lot, but that's. Yeah. I want to tell you in this moment that I honor you. I honor you for saying that I'm going to share my story. I honor you for walking in your truth. You know, even though the truth sucks sometimes and it's not always what we want to yeah. be able to tell and share about ourselves. But I just feel like in this moment, mm -hmm. you're very courageous that you are mm -hmm. changing the lives of other men because we also know that there's a small percentage of men who have been molested by their mothers. 
And I think it's yeah. more than what's being documented. And I believe a lot of men can be able to relate to your story. And, and society always says it's another male or, you know, male on male, that's who's doing the molesting. And that when it's a woman, it's, I want to do this. And it's not. So you are breaking the normal, the societal norm of how people look at male survivors. And so I thank you for that. I really did. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and I, 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 I don't know if you know Dr. David Lee Sack or not with one in six, but he came here to interview me uh, to my home. And, you know, he's, you know, he, he has a past as well. And, uh, in, in all deference to anybody who's had anything like this happen to him, whether it was you know, but done by a man, done by a woman, or or, or whomever, uh, what what I'm trying to figure out how to parse this so it sounds respectful to anybody, okay? But I told him that I had almost rather been raped in the quote conventional sense by another man than had done to me what my mom did. And that's, I don't mean that like that sounds, but that's, I that's how much it hurts. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's just, and God knows that, you know, I, I know a lot of men who have been raped by, by men and I know what that did to them. So I don't, in all deference to anybody, that's because there's no, there's no gradation of trauma. It's all what, how, how it is to you is how it is to you. And that's, uh, but that's what I told him, and uh, I don't I don't like being in that percentage, and I I, I abhor the and it gets used. All right, so I'm going to I'm just going to come out and say it. You know, everybody uses it, says uses the term motherfucker, and uh, but I feel it, and I feel it on mother. You know, we just had Mother's Day. I feel it on Mother's Day, and so I can't. You know, to those women who've been been assaulted by men, I I can't imagine what that what that must feel like because I know what I feel like and I do it just it hurts me for them and um, so I do whatever I can and, and not being a trained counselor or anything like that I, I just you know open up myself and you know let them know that this is some place they can go and a lot of times they'll come to my garage just to talk because you know I get it you create a safe space, so that's important. Uh, I do want to know, do you think that somebody could have did something to protect you? You know, I've looked back and I, I try to recall who I could have gone to. And, you know, my mother and her sister, were they were pretty good friends. Not just sisters, but they were young. They were my mother was three years older than, than her and she was the baby. And so their, their closeness, I don't think, I think is what kept me from saying anything at the time when I look back, but we didn't have um, social service agencies. I mean, we did, but I didn't know anything about that. I didn't, I don't know who I would have told at school. You know, I was already, you know, mocked and made fun enough as it were. So if there was anything, I don't know who I would have gone to. I don't, you know, in my small world, there wasn't anyone I could tell. You know, I ask you that because I want parents to know that children do not always feel like they have somebody to tell. Even if you have a parent or a family member that's saying, oh, if anything happens, you can talk to me or they have the school or they have these systems in place. You don't always tell, you know, so you really have to pay attention to what's going on with our children. And it's hard when it's another family member. And the fact that one third of child sexual abuse is from incest lets us know that you have to look at your spouse as well. You have to look at the person that birthed the child. And that's difficult. Or you have to look at the brother or the sister, the siblings to really bring that out. And I want parents to know that this is something that you've got to pay attention to. And sometimes our children don't come forward and they don't feel like they have anybody to talk to. And so that's why I'm real big on going to the schools, going to different programs and telling them, 
like what it means and that this is wrong and giving them an outlet, a safe space to come to. I think that's important for us to do as advocates. So thank you for expressing that in that moment, you didn't feel like you could tell somebody, you know, wasn't. Yeah. And, and you didn't even tell your dad. You know, what I yeah. You know, after being told he didn't want me and then he carried out act, feel like he didn't. You know, that just confirmed it. Uh, my aunt, you know, she told me, she said, I wish you, I wish you would have told me. And, and I said, I didn't, I just didn't think you'd believe me. And, you know, it, you know, those behaviors that come out in, in a child, like a sick stomach, kids don't get sick stomachs unless they have a flu. If a child's got a sick stomach, something's wrong. And, you know, that nobody recognized that. And, I, you know, I got myself up, I got my clothes on, I brushed my teeth as best I could, and I would go to school, and I was a joke a minute, you know, I found the more I joked, the more people were laughing, and when people were laughing, I was laughing, and they were, we weren't, I wasn't thinking about what was going on, and, you know, I, you know, I brought that into adulthood, and that's, uh, I've gotten away from that because I, you know, my motivation for why is as big as why I did that has become a big part of how I teach, you know, when I, when I, you know, you know, teach a military unit or something like that and how impactful and how hurtful those, those things are. And, uh, so it's, um, uh, it's been a, it's been a work in progress over the last 45 years, but you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm all right, but, what did you the do? The path has been, it's not been easy. Go what ahead. Did your, what does your journey, your healing journey look like? What did you do? What's well, next? After you disclosed to your counselor, what's next? Well, I, I uh, there's nothing I didn't want. I wanted, all of a sudden, I wanted to do everything I possibly could. And I'm not for, you know, up until that point, I would get bored with a job. Once I mastered it, I didn't want to do it anymore. And that included being, you know, a state trooper. And um, it's like once I once I figured it out, you know, I, and then unfortunately I, I was in that shooting, but I just I didn't want to do it anymore. After that, there wasn't anything I didn't want to do, and I wanted to learn as much as I could. And so I so I uh, I got my teaching certificate, and I went back to, I picked up a social studies degree. I, I got an electrician license. Um, I became a Mason, and I don't mean um, the Masonic order, although I am a Mason, but I'm also a block layer too. I'm, I'm both. I I, uh, I built I built an I built an office max. I built part of WVU's indoor football practice stadium just because I wanted to know how to do it. And I built homes. Uh, so that's part of heavy the equipment. This is part of the healing. Well, so staying busy, yeah. learning and moving. That's how you started. I, 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 there was nothing. There wasn't anything I didn't want to know how to do. I dabbled in a little bit of astrophysics. I mean, you know, cosmology just you know, just blew me away. And uh, but the the big yeah you know, the big thing was was talking to people. Those first you know year or two afterwards, uh, and trying to find out how to how to get beyond it. So. If part of that was uh, I sat down one night and you know, I was urged to write and I had a conversation with God and I I just started asking questions and I got answers. And I mean, I would it was all unscripted and I never knew what was going to happen. But I, I would sit at my laptop and I would write for hours and I'd ask questions about things that were you know, that had stuck with me from when I was a little boy and why those things had happened. And I, you know, I was like, it was like, that was a cleansing kind of thing that, 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 that came with that. Because once I got the why I was okay, I'm good. All right. And so it was like, once I got it out of me, it wasn't inside anymore. It was right. out here. I could look at it and I could own it. And I really, really felt good I mean, to not carry that. I was so 
And then I started working on me and it's like, all right, so if I'm going to embrace this, I decided that there are some things about me I don't like. And um, I didn't like the fact that I could be jealous. I didn't like that. And we all know when we have a jealous thought or a jealous emotion, or if we act on a spiteful feeling, we know when we're doing it. And it's when we, we say that we don't, we're living contrary to who we are. Um, and we lie about it. It's like, well, that's not how I meant it. You know, we know when we're being jealous or spiteful or envious. We know that. And every time I caught myself being envious of somebody because they had something or they're, it was usually a thing because I grew up so poor that, that, you know, I, I, we, I didn't have anything. You know, we never had a car. We didn't have TV. Uh, it was easy for me to be that way. And I was like that. So I started working on that. And every time I caught myself being jealous or envious of somebody or something or some job that somebody had, I would stop and I would talk to myself and acknowledge the fact that I'd, I'd felt that way. And, you know, it, it took, it, it was work and it, it probably took me, I'm going to just throw a number out there. It probably took me half a year, maybe nine months. Yeah. And I, so I, I just, all of a sudden I, it was like, okay, so here's another layer of feeling better. And the second thing was I, I taught myself to not use the word hate. And that was, I thought we, we, we throw it out there. So, you know, flippantly, uh, like I hate Mondays. I hate my job, you know, I hate my boyfriend or my girlfriend because they do this. Uh, I hate traffic and you know, the, 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 it sounds new age, but the negative energy that that creates when you say the word hate and the emotion that it stirs inside you, your, your fibers, your cells, your body feels that. And every time I would use that word, I would correct myself. I learned to correct myself and I'd stop myself and I would find some other idiom or some other way of saying that I blank as opposed to using hate this object or thing to where all of a sudden I didn't hate anything. I didn't hate my job. I didn't hate my car. I, I didn't hate anything. I didn't hate anybody. And I learned that, um, uh, all of a sudden, that was a pretty good world to live in, not in spite of what had happened to me, but because of it. And that was that was pretty profound I, to not be jealous and to not be hateful. And and I it, and there were sometimes I would even I would purposely throw the word love in there just to do the opposite of it. And I found that, you know, if you know, we can hate somebody that we don't know. Well, why can't I love them better if I don't know? Them? What's what's the difference? And. That was that was those that healing over the next few year few years as a result of that was a was a pretty big deal and that's that's just how I did it I, you know it was nobody told me to and it was just I just felt like this is what for me I have to do and so it 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 brought me to it brought me out of being a jealous racist bigot bigoted homophobic spiteful human being who oftentimes had was pretty caring and pretty giving, but I had those traits. I didn't want those anymore. I didn't want to be that way. And before I go any further, I, I need to acknowledge that, you know, Randy King, the teacher who rescued me, you know, that guy had the biggest impact on me of, of anybody else. And it ties in with this was when I talked to Dr. Lisak about it, he, you know, he called, you know, he talked about phenomenology. And, you know, I said that about, you know, the way I grew up and how I behaved as an adult and being racist or homophobe, you know, cracking jokes. And, you know, I, I used a racist term when I was 16 years old in front of Randy. And he turned and looked at me and he said, what's that? And Randy was a hippie. And Randy was a good man. And he knew what he was doing when he said that. And I said, you know, and he said, man, I've never heard that word before. And all of a sudden, I was never the same person after that. I did not want to quit school. I didn't want, I didn't want to be that person at that instant I was going to be. And so that was central 
to how I, I healed and grew after those, co well, those couple of years after I came out of counseling. Yeah. And that's what Dr. Lisak and I talked about. That was, that was my moment. I was 16 years old and I said that. And I never, I knew I, would, I, I was never going to be a bomb. And I never was going, I was never ever going to hurt anybody. And that was, uh, that, that healing that took, took place after the couple of years with, with my counselor that, that two years following that, that was, that's what I held on to. That was, that's what drove me. And, uh, I am, uh, I own it whenever I do a training, I own it up front. It's like, cause I'm, I'm not going to be the person who somebody says, well, I know how you were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. You're a hypocrite now for doing this. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that happen. And I, and I always tell them and if, if you, to know somebody, you have to know their memories. And if you're not willing to change your mind, you're not using it. And when you know better, you should do better. And I tie my, my story in with that training because there are so many people, if you have a unit of, of a hundred, hundred men and one out of every six of those have, have, have been, and that's just a, a guess, you know, been molested. That's 15 to 18. And if you have those 18 guys stand up in that unit and I'll tell them, look around you guys, this is how many people in here have been molested when they were boys. Every time you crack that joke, you're, you're hitting in their soul. And, and the same thing applies for women. So I, uh, I own that up front. I don't, you know, I'm never, ever going to not do that. Anytime I do a training, that's, I bring that right out to the front. And when I, when I learned that, you know, in, in those military units where, where it was 75% you know, more likelihood that a woman was going to be assaulted as a, the, the permissiveness attitude of, of sexual innu innuendo and jokes, I, I just, I'm not doing that anymore. That I, I to say I felt guilty about how I'd behave is, is a is not a big enough word, and it's it's too profound to not own that and and lead from the front instead of you know follow along behind and and be you know that guy that well oh, you used to be that way you know, I'm just I'm not gonna do it. I I like that you said that you started identifying things that you want to change about yourself. I think men can take that away from this story and also women we have to look at our lives and say what do we want to change what is it that we don't like about ourselves do we want to forgive do we want to change the hate do we want to change how we treat others you know how we respond to the abuse and i like that you identified that about yourself and did the work it is hard to heal from any type of sexual trauma it is not easy you have to put in the work and you have to be open and honest about what you went through and I always say that's how you start working on eliminating the shame and getting to the next point in life. Um, Dr. Lisak, I think is phenomenal. I have not met him, but I've looked at all of his work and I love how he focuses on men, you know, and even the predators and the survivors. And I love that. And I think it's important for men to understand that it is a hard journey, but that it's possible to come out and advocate for others as well. It's, it's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you said that about, you know, you, you, you know, the, the male survivors and well, as you said, and you said, I believe you said perpetrators as well. And yeah. just, you know, he's working prisons yeah. and, you know, he, he, he's talked, he talked to me about, uh, you know, men who've been in there forever and they're not the same person. Mm -hmm. change, the change can happen. You just have to know you can do it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah, I, I often say to people, you know, you have, you have three stages you can go through. You can hope, you can believe, or you can know. And, you know, it's, I, I jokingly say hope's not a battle plan. You know, you don't go, you don't go into combat hoping this is going to work. You know, that's why we train and we train and we train because you have to know it's going to work because, you know, the, the, the alternative is not acceptable. And, so I, I want people to know. I don't want them to just hope and believe. I want them to know that they can, you know, that you can. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I can tell you right now, I'm not that person, you know, that I was 20 years ago. I'm not. I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. And I do everything I can to counter that, to live just the opposite of that. And so, I'm, and that's, but it's put me in a, in a good place. So I'm not. 
you know, I, I'm not, I'm not wealthy, but I'm financially well. Uh, I'm a self-made hundred air, by the way. So, uh, you know, it's just because I, I believe and I know that I'm going to be okay. Mm-hmm. I know that my future is going to be okay. And with that. that knowing, it seems to just create that. And I never, ever thought that that would be possible. I thought I was always doomed to struggle and, and work and scrape. And you know, the last 20 years since, since I told, told, told the doctor, I've not had to work at anything. It's just happened. I love it. You know, you're advocating on behalf of others and you're trying to do things to raise awareness about child sexual abuse, about sexual assault. And you have the most amazing event coming up that I can't believe that you're doing. The West West Virginia National Guard South Cycling Out Sexual Assault. So let me say that again. <laughs> West Virginia National Guard Cycling Out Sexual Assault. How many mouths are you riding, Mike, to raise awareness about this topic? What are you, what are you doing? So it's, you know, I, I, I get on my bicycle in Pittsburgh and I, I ride to Washington, D.C., and that's about 350 miles. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had 16 surgeries on my feet and my knees and my shoulders. And so I'm not allowed to run. I've got four herniated discs in my lower back. Uh, torn labrum in my right hip socket. And so I'm not allowed to run. And the only thing that doesn't hurt is my bald spot. And I have fibromyalgia. So I, I can say with some authority what I know what pain is. But when I get on that bicycle and I pedal and I, the harder the hill is or the steeper the mountain I have to pedal up, the, the more of a challenge it becomes to prove to myself that I can do that. But when I'm pedaling that bike, I don't feel pain. And that's the only time I don't. And so uh, when, when I get on that ride, it, it gets miserable and your butt gets sore and you're, you know, my left knee, it's bone on bone. There's no cartilage. There's no meniscus in there. And I just block it out and, I just focus, you know, it's like I saw a picture of Lance Armstrong once and you can see there was nothing but 2000% focus on his mind. And that's how I feel when I'm on that bike. I don't feel pain. And uh, that's when I feel the best. I mean, that, I mean, it's like, you know, I used to run, you know, 10, 15 miles a day and I'd get into that runner, I'd get that runner's high. And if, if you've never experienced that, it's, you know, I know you've been in the military. If, if I don't know if you've if you've experienced that or not, but we, I haven't. I don't have a runner's high, Mike. I don't like to run. Well, I let me tell like you to. what. I would. <laughs> I would get out there. I would. I would run, and I just couldn't stop. I just. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't stop. Not so like you know. <laughs> no. so, so Two miles. I, Two miles and two I miles an hour. That was it. I didn't want to go to four or six. I was mad. <laughs> two miles was the max because God did not create me to be a runner. Sure. So that, that running high you're talking about? Nah, I don't. Well, I, don't I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so when I get on when I get on the bike, that's how I feel. You feel like that? I'm back, yeah. You know, back where I belong, and then this is, I don't hurt. So I, yeah. you know, I, I got to. I did a, a short two day ride a few years ago and I think we went, oh gosh, you know, 140 miles or something like this. First, first ride of any length I'd ever done. And there were, I think there were four of us that did it. We just, we just did it. Just a bunch of guys to get together and go down. We rode to the great Allegheny passage from, from Pittsburgh to Cumberland, Maryland. And I was talking with my wife about it, how good it felt. And she said, you know, and she's smarter than I am, and I'm big enough to admit it. Okay, she's the brains, and I'm the back. And uh, she said, "You ought to maybe do something with your with your victim advocate work." And I said, "Maybe I should do a bike ride." And she said, "Yeah, that's what she was thinking." And so that's how it started. Love and it. Uh, I just I got the idea, and I called our uh, state SARC, uh, and I know you know what that is, but it's a, the Sexual Assault Response Coordinator. And she just thought it was a wonderful idea and she got behind me on it and, you know, gave me a lot of help on doing a flyer and, and how to, you know, she helped me with, with the public affairs, getting a, you know, getting a flyer out and getting a little bit of public publicity on the face on the state's Facebook page. 
So when we started doing it, uh, I had my niece, and she belongs to San as well. Uh, she, she, I asked her to start publishing uh, blurbs about, uh, you know, rape, domestic violence statistics. Okay. Well, yeah. And every time I would stop somewhere, she would, she would just post it. Or she, well, even if I wouldn't stop, she would just, she posts stuff for me every day along the way, all day long. You know, she, she'll get, she'll get in that internet and she digs stuff up out of there. Mike, just, I, yeah. I, I hate to interrupt you, but I have a very, a couple of questions that are important that I want to address before sure. we go through a bike. Um, Norman wants to know, is abuse a choice and can illness influence it? What do you think about that? Do you think that people can't help it sometimes? I do. Yeah, I don't have, again, that's, I'm not a, I don't have data to back that up. Well, so, from the person, not data, but just from your personal experience from like with yeah, your yeah. mom, your mom was sick. Do you think she had a choice? Wow. You know, I, I, gosh, I don't know. Um, the fact that she did it makes me feel like no. But in that little boy's eyes, she did. That's the adult in me who understands how what can happen with a mental illness. I, I you know, I, I can understand how that would have had something to do with it. I don't know if if parents with borderline personality uh, are given to that kind of, of behavior. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I, it seems like there are four types of borderline personalities, but uh, you know, with uh, when it comes to children, there's something wrong, inherently wrong with somebody that does that to a child. And, you know, I've, I've heard of 13 year olds doing it to six year olds. So, you know, that's a child on a child. You know, and I don't know what has maybe set up a 13 year old to behave that way. But I think that that's not without some merit. I think that, you know, the fact that an adult can do that to a child is something's not right. Uh, but uh, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one to grapple with, you know, but what it does to the child, no matter whether they had, a, whether the adult could help it or not, is just, you know, why they need that protection, I guess. You know, was there a second part to that question or one? That- yeah. Um, you answered it. Cause I don't think you ever thought about, did your mom have a choice? You just looked at your mom did it period. And yeah. it was wrong. And yeah. so it's important to acknowledge that she did it. She was wrong, no matter what was going on in her life. Norman said he feels that although you may have a personality disorder, it is still a conscious choice. I think if a person can say um, right from wrong, if you understand right from wrong, if you understand pain and hurting somebody else, um, I could see how maybe that is a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know and, and, I, I'm wrong and I'm hurting you. Then I could see it as a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do too. Uh, it's there's you know there's just that I, I'm not without compassion to anybody that has an issue, and that's that that small percentage that I feel that little bit of wiggle room is is why I, I throw I, I parse the answer like I do, if that if that makes any sense. But yeah. uh, that was still. No, it's just it's wrong. Yeah. yeah. He said um, people don't, don't think that it's wrong, that they think their choices are perfect, that it's right. And mm-hmm. and sometimes I don't think all people, Norman, some people know that that's wrong. Mm-hmm. There are people that know that what they're doing is wrong. It's self-gratification. It's selfish. When you um, approach somebody from a, a sexual gratification for your own self, because they're not being satisfied, it's really for yourself. I think they may try to act like they know. I won't want to say it's not wrong, but you know when you hurt somebody else. For some mm-hmm. And I don't give people excuses. And that's why we do so much training and so much awareness because you need to know that this is happening to you and if it's wrong or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're the person that's doing it, shame on you. You mm-hmm. should hold the shame and not the individual that you're abusing. And that's that's my standpoint on it, Norman. Yeah. I believe you got the ability to say right from wrong. 
you understand that and you know that it's causing pain, you're wrong. I agree. Some people get a thrill making other and seeing other people suffer. Indeed, they do. And and I don't know, Mike, if I always have compassion for everybody. Now, I'll pray for you, right? I'm praying for you. I'm asking for you, for forgiveness, for God. I hope you get your life together. But I'm not in your corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I am yeah. not. Once you hurt a child or you hurt somebody, you just don't have me in your corner no more. Mm hmm you know, I don't need you, but you don't have my support. Yeah, <laughs> I am with you there. Yeah. All right. He has one more question. Sure. Is it true most abusers were abused themselves? No, I know you're going to say I don't have the stats on that. So I would not. All abusers did were not abused themselves, Norman. And it's not most. Oh, no. Uh -uh. Yeah. We have people that have been abused that did not choose to abuse somebody else. They did not. They never wanted it to happen to somebody else. They got help. Sometimes they didn't get help, but they just did not do it again. Then you have people that have been abused that makes the decision to abuse somebody else and do the same thing to them. And so um, it's not that all abusers have been abused before. Some people just take advantage of others. And like I, I said, self-gratification. It's, it's harmful and it's taking control over somebody else's life and it's wrong. So when we look at abusers, all of them have not been abused. People make a conscious decision, like you said earlier on. What do you think about that, Mike? Just from you're you're dead on the the, the you know the I that's something that I do know. The, okay, the, so you the got numbers, you on that. Okay. Yeah, the numbers start. the numbers don't support that. The abusers, oh. those those who have been abused statistically don't become abusers. No, nope. they know what it's like. That's, you know, there are a lot of them who have, but no, that's a, that's a, that's now, a, that's a falsehood. He said, if you look at most abusers, serial killers, they have a troubled childhood, but a troubled childhood is different from abuse. Well, that's right. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, it's all different types of childhood, different things, you know, so it's it, not it, that. Yeah. If you go with that, you know, my childhood was troubled. I should be a demon yeah. and I should be, you know, statistically, I should be a bomb if that's, if that's the case. And I chose everywhere along the way to be what I am, you know, to not hurt somebody, to not yeah. go knock off, not go rob a store, not, not hurt anybody physically. You know, I, I choose to not do that. I, that's, I, I choose to not do that. The thought of hurting somebody in any way, I'm in the profession of arms, and the last thing I ever want to do is inflict harm on anybody. I don't ever. I, I'm just. I'm, I don't want to do that. So I make that choice, and you know, somebody decides that they're going to, you know, you know, rob a store or you know, uh, mug someone. They're making a choice to do that. They're deciding I want what they have. Somebody breaks into my house. That's because they want whatever it is I have in here. They chose to do that. And so that's the bottom line. That's what I, I, I'd say too. <laughs> You're choosing. Um, now people have been abused and they become abusers, but mm -hmm. that is not majority. That is not always the norm. No. People do no. have trauma, different types of trauma in their lives. That's not child sexual abuse. But just because you have trauma in your life doesn't give you a blank card to be able to do what you want to other people. Right. We don't have crap in our life growing up. Everybody didn't grow up in a perfect childhood, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you could see. have had it worse. There are people had a hundred times worse than me. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you, Norman. That those are some great questions, and I really yeah, that, that one was a thinker for me. I appreciate that. The fact they abuse mostly intimate partners and nobody else shows it is a choice. The fact that they abuse mostly intimate partners and nobody else shows it is a choice. Um, I, I still stand, stand on my stance, even if it's domestic violence, um, intimate partner violence, you still make a choice to abuse somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they can, because, you because can. they're able to, sub they have dominion over someone and they can subject them to it because they have that power and they choose to exert it. Yep. And so I, I agree. Nobody else shows it is a choice. You know, mm -hmm. but it's, I look at it as choice.
So. Now I will, I do qualify one, not that I, not, not a qualification, but when I point that out, what I sometimes point out and I don't, I don't get into the psychology of it, but oftentimes somebody who chooses to remain in a relationship where they are abused or, you know, beaten or, or whatever, it says a lot about their sense of self-worth. You can almost always define somebody's sense of self-worth by how they allow their intimate partner to treat them. You're saying, this is what I deserve. And that, that goes to their past. Okay. You know, how they were brought up, what they, you know, what they saw, what they were subjected to. And um, that's an opinion, but you know, if, if a woman allows a man to demean her in public, you know, and doesn't, she probably has a pretty small opinion of herself. Her esteem's probably pretty low, you know. And if he's building her up all the time, you know, then that's that's just its opposite. That's that's Mike talking. But I always I try to point that out. And this is never to justify what anybody does to somebody else. If they're making a choice to hit that person. That's just that's it. The bottom you line. You have a choice to respond. Um, mm -hmm. Is it a decision if you want to leave a relationship? Or that's correct. You have that choice. You have a choice to heal. You have a choice to not to allow your trauma affect you. You know, we, we have choices in life mm -hmm. to really get to the next level. And I could just tell from your choice, like becoming an advocate was a choice for you mm -hmm. to make a difference and to stand up. You know? Yeah. What's the point of having free will on this planet if you don't exercise it? Right. Right. It's a choice. And mm -hmm. we all had them, you know, and I work very hard to make a choice every day to have a great day. Yeah. Well, and I, and I absolutely, I, and there are days it is work. Yeah. And I, because the alternative is not, is pretty dark, but I am, it's work to be happy all the time. And so I'm never, ever unhappy, but you know, when you have physical pain all the time, like I do, and you were molested by your mother, you know, it's, and you're happy. Well, you, to, to hold all those emotions and all these physical feelings at bay is work. You know? But I choose to do that. I don't have to, I could take it out on everybody around me. But why would I do that? I don't want them to be miserable. I don't want that. I choose to make them happy. And, well, thanks for that opening on that. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> You will get a, you get me on choice. I talk about some choices every day. I make a choice. I'm gonna get out of the bed or not. So, um, so back to your cycling. Um, I, I do want you to mention because we're we're over an hour, and I try to keep it less than an hour for everybody. But tell us about your event, the dates, and how they can contact you if they would like to participate. Okay, so the, I have a cycling out sexual assault Facebook page. All right, and then of course I'm on there, Mike Cochran. And uh, I have an email address, M as in Mike, U as in uniform, Cochran at Gmail. So that's that's how you can get a hold of me. And it's coming up really quickly next Thursday on the 20th. Uh, we're going to head out of Pittsburgh around 830. And uh, that night we'll stay in a little town called Ohio Pile, Pennsylvania. It's white. It's a white water heaven up there. And the second night is in Cumberland, Maryland just over the Eastern Continental Divide. And that those those two days are the that's, that's the Great Allegheny Passage Trail or Gap Trail. That can be Googled if anybody cares to look it up. And then from Cumberland to Hancock, Maryland, that's the third day. And that's on the what's called the CNO Canal Towpath, uh, the Chesapeake in Ohio. It's an old towpath that was built back in the 1800s. Uh, and it's a series of old, old historic locks and dams that they used to mules to tow, tow old barges up with water that was diverted from you know, at the beginning of from the Potomac River. And they made it as far as Cumberland, but the, the rail, the railroad took over, and, and that that uh, that dream went away. So the the fourth day is from Hancock to Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, and uh, then the fifth day is from Harpers Ferry to Washington, D.C. And this year we should be ending our ride at the National Guard Bureau headquarters in Arlington. And uh, uh, they, I believe that they're, they're trying to have some kind of small reception in the work for when I get there. And, uh, 
and that, that's pretty much it. But anybody, if they want, they can ride as long as they want or as little as they want if they decide that this is, you know, something they want to do or, or somewhere near, if they're somewhere near that and want to come out and say, hey, then, yeah, God bless you. I'd love to see you. Yeah, I love it. I think it's a great event. I'm so happy that you're doing it. I think it's a great idea. And so hopefully someone will call you, email you and say, hey, I want to join you or at least go out on your trail and support you and help raise awareness because sexual assault is real. Child sexual abuse is real. Our children are being hurt and touched and so are our adults. And so how can we make some changes and raise some awareness? So I love that. Is there anything, last words, Mike, that you want to share before we get out of here to maybe encourage some male survivors? You know, we, I, I think about things like that and all my, you know, when I have a business card and down in the bottom corner of it, it says acceptance is the bridge to understanding and with understanding comes temperance. And, you know, we've spent our whole lives trying to run away from things that happened to us. And when I accepted what happened to me and then I understood it and when I understood it, then my emotions became tempered and, that's the only way you can heal. You know, you, you have to go through those steps. You know, uh, if you're willing to do it and do the work, then, you know, if, if a wretch like me can do it, then God knows anybody on this planet can. And, you know, my job is to hear it is to you know, tell everybody I'm, a, I'm just a one. I'm just a tooth on a great big sprocket. And, you know, if I help somebody out just a tiny little bit, send them in the right direction. Well, I mean, hey, the net effect of, it's like, well, we need to stop trying to improve one thing a thousand percent and try to improve a thousand things one percent. You know, the net effect is going to trickle out there and, and, and the net effect is going to be a whole lot greater. And that's I think that's all we can do. Get our egos out of the way and just do the right thing. If you are a male survivor, it is a lot of work. You got to put in the work. I tell people that all the time. Women survivors, you got to put in the work. If you want to heal and have a better life, it is possible. It is a lifelong journey because you're always working towards it. But we could do this together. Um, we're here. We have free counseling, support you no matter where you are in the country. And, and it, counseling really does work. And if you are in counseling and you don't like your counselor, don't give up. Find another one. If you've been in counseling before and it didn't work, don't give up. Find another one because you could find a, a counselor all over. And we have counselors on our staff, too, that's able to help you and just get you to that next level. So I appreciate you. Um, Norman says most men suffer in silence. Indeed, in that inner child. So I agree with you, Norman, that men do suffer in silence, but you don't have to. That's why I'm a big advocate on hush no more. <laughs> and you can also become an advocate like Mike. Mike yeah. is changing the world with his <laughs> advocacy and talking to men and just standing up for what's right and saying, look, you know, some of us have been abused and we didn't want to. We didn't want to be with that woman, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the motherfucker. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what it yeah. was. So yeah. I look forward to hearing you speak on that even more, like that being your platform, because I think you're an amazing advocate. And you're thank an amazing you. Survivor, and I truly, truly appreciate you today. So thank yeah. you. Well, th thanks. So God bless you for having me on here. Uh, you know, any, anytime I get a chance to talk, I'll do it. <laughs> and this is, this is, yeah, I am my favorite subject. All right. So <laughs> I know me the best. I love so, it. Uh, Nobody tell your story like you could tell you. <laughs> that, 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 that's time. right. That's right. <laughs> and, and, but to, to, to that point there about some men suffer, suffering in silence, you know, I, I do want to interject. You know, we, I may have pain, but I don't suffer. One's a state of mind. The other is a feeling, okay? And we don't have to suffer. I can I can have pain and be happy, but I don't. We don't have to suffer. We choose to do that. We don't have to. I love that. Yeah, that's great closing remarks. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So Hush No More is normally here on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next Tuesday, we're going to have Arthur Mitchell, and he's going to talk about your disability and how it does not define who you are. And then the next Tuesday, on the 25th, we're going to have Dr. Liza Jones, and she's going to talk about how can you advocate and get in the fight, even though you have your own trauma. We can still help other people to get through some things while we're struggling and, and having a battle and then overcoming it, doing the work and, and getting to the next level. 
So you can also join us at Art Therapy tomorrow night at 7, 30, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do Art Therapy. You don't have to know how to draw. You just come in and laugh with us and do some artwork and just get away from your day. And we just love that. Um, October 16th, put it on your calendar. We have our Hush No More Domestic Violence Walk. So I hope you all are signing up and getting the team together so that you can support us no matter where you are in the country. If you're in Columbia, South Carolina, we would love to have you join us. And if you would like to be a guest on Hush No More Champions, you can go to our website, www.hushnomore.org, and fill out the application. And we are also looking for poets for our Hush No More Poetry book. If you are healing and you use poetry to do that, please share our poetry with, with us. You can also contact us at 1-888-285-2161. We are always available to support you no matter where you are in the world. So peace and blessings to you all. Thank you for this moment. Share with a survivor, a male survivor, and encourage them and pour into them. Good night. Thank you, Mike. Take care.